Welcome to another Founder Wisdom Pod today with Heather Osgood. Uh, she's big time into podcasting, so we're going to have a very fun convo today. She's the founder at True Native Media. She does ad podcast advertising there. That's really cool, by the way. We're going to talk about that for sure. She's also founder at The Podcast Broker. So this pod is brought to you by my uh, podcasting company. You can also check out uh, Heather's company if you want to start scale or be invited to podcasts like this one uh, you'll hear me and Heather talk about the wonders of podcasting today whether that is learning from folks that you would normally get to speak to networking with these folks sharing the good news with a bunch of people for free that's doing good right there and even generating leads and clients from podcasting so it's going to be a fun one. Heather, can you tell us a bit more about yourself and about your businesses? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I founded True Native Media in January of 2016, and True Native Media is a podcast representation firm. So our role is to work with podcasters and connect them with advertisers. And I founded the business because I actually sold a company that I had had for almost 10 years. Um, so I had a trade show production company. And when I sold that, I didn't have anything to do for the first time as an adult. And so one day my husband's like, you should listen to these podcasts. And so I started listening to podcasts and my first thought was where are all the ads? Well, it turns out that at that time you had to have at least 50,000 downloads per episode to receive representation on your show. And I knew that I had the ability to sell ads on podcasts that were much smaller. And so I founded the company really to um, service those content creators that didn't have anyone in their corner. Um, podcast monetization has been kind of a big question mark for a long time. And, you know, now that I've been in the industry for almost, seven, um, actually almost eight years now, um, that has changed. And, you know, there's a lot more monetization options now. But, you know, when I started, it was really difficult to create a podcast and actually make money from it. Wow. Um, yeah, these were like the John Lee Dumas days, uh, which I had on my pod. And mm -hmm. It was like when you had to download the MP3s, I would guess, or something like that. Um, what fascinated you in first place from podcasts? Because our ancestors would listen to radio. I did listen to a bit of radio, especially yeah. Sirius back in my days. Uh, but for me, I was straight uh, born into a podcasting world. That's how I got most of my education, just like I was born in front of a computer screen. You know, so what at first lit that that's podcasting spark in you? Yeah. So I was super into audio books. Um, I was an outside sales rep, sold actually radio advertising, and I used to listen to cassette tapes of audiobooks and then CDs with audiobooks. And I listened to a lot of AM radio. And when I, I originally listened to a podcast, it was just as you said, like you had to download the MP3 on your computer, you had to upload it to your iPod. And I was like, this is way too much work. Like, this is ridiculous. I'm not going to do this. And, and it, I mean, it just took a long time. So um, at that point, I was really not interested in podcasts. But when I started in 2016, there was the natively installed podcast app on your iPhone and, and discovering that was like this huge revelation to me because as you mentioned there's just so much knowledge so much that you can gain from listening to podcasts and as an entrepreneur and a salesperson and somebody who's super into self-improvement and and health and all those things just being able to access that information and i remember the first time and i listened to john lee dumas's podcast and i was a guest on his show also and um, I remember the first time that I, I don't know who it was, but I was listening to a conversation between two really high level CEOs. And I thought, this is like, I'm literally in the room with these people. I would never have had the opportunity to be included in a conversation like this in the past. And the fact that I get to listen in to their thought processes and the way they approach business and the way that they accomplish their goals and conquer their days. And I'm like, to me, all of that was just total gold. And, and it still is, right? I mean, I think the fact that you're able to really see inside someone's um, day-to-day 
life. And I mean, and yeah, there is a ton of interview podcasts now, um, but I still love them, right? I, I still love the interview podcast because you get a chance, you know, Charles, if you and I met at, let's say a conference and we were in a corner, you know, chatting up what it was like to be, a, you know, a founder of a business, no one else would get to benefit from that conversation. We might have a great time, but the fact that we can record something and put it out there to the world is really fascinating. And that's what really drew me to it. And just knowing that in order to allow this kind of ecosphere to continue to grow, I really wanted to invest in it. And I knew that monetization piece was really important. How long did it take you to actually feel the traction behind your podcast? You know, that's a great question. Um, I started it knowing I had started other businesses before. Obviously, I had my trade show production company, which was, had been the most successful prior to that. I started the business knowing that it wasn't going to, you know, come out the gate just gangbusters. And so I would say like the first six months was really a trial and error period, uh, you know, understanding the industry. Um, when you start you know, I, I feel like the best way to start a business is to start selling something, right? Because the minute you start selling something, all of a sudden you hear all of the objections like, um, you know, oh, well, what about this? You hear questions that maybe you don't have answers to. So that first six months was really so much learning. And for me, it was all about plugging into advertising agencies who were buying podcast ads. So the minute that I was able to form a relationship with one of the leading podcast ad agencies that were doing a lot of podcast ad buying at the time for like Casper and companies like that, they kind of schooled me on, no, no, this is how you sell podcast ads. Like give us these things and we'll buy from you. And as soon as I knew what to provide them, then that really paved the path for me to start creating success. And so, yeah, that's when we really started to, to get some traction. How much subscribers or downloads was that? Well, so I was representing at that time, I probably had about 20 different podcasts that I was representing. The one of the very first podcasts that I took on had 500 downloads and retrospectively, that was way too low. Like I had a really hard time selling ads on that show. Um, and I found that when I got to about the 5,000 download per episode range that it worked really well. And so for me, that's kind of where I started was, okay, you need to have at least 5,000 downloads per episode, and then I'll represent you. And then each year I would just raise the bar up higher and higher. Um, and now we're looking for 50,000 downloads per month in order to represent a podcast. Okay. How do you pick the podcasts other than the that quantity that you have just mentioned there do you also evaluate their potential of growth do you evaluate the interviewer because i realized uh, lately that not everyone is gifted to be a good interviewer ironically in my case i'm someone that loves to talk a lot but i really discovered the hyper benefit of asking great questions because mm -hmm. I forgot who said that, but 80% of getting the answers is asking the right question. That's really true. Um, what are your criterias and all the criterias uh, that you uh, put to select uh, your potential clients? So first we do look at size, right? Because if the audience size is too small, the advertiser isn't going to see results. And most of our ads are direct response advertisers. So that is important. Um, next for me, it's looking at production quality. If the show isn't produced well, then it isn't going to be a good representation of that advertiser. So an advertiser wants to partner with a, a show that they feel like is at a similar caliber as their organization is. So production quality is important consistency in posting content if we have a show that's super erratic and you know maybe they post you know one every day for 10 days and then they don't post another show for three months and then they post one a week you know any any time that there's erratic posting behavior that's a red flag because 
audience sizes and listenership is based on your ability to create consistent content. Um, and it doesn't like, you know, we have shows that produce two episodes a month, right? It's not the quantity, it's really the consistency. Um, and then we're going to look at topic, right? So uh, if you are a business show, if you are in health and fitness, in productivity, female lifestyle, sports, comedy, those genres are going to sell much better than more obscure, you know, content. Uh, we worked with a really large dictionary company um, and I thought, oh my gosh, this company is going to be great. Like it's a great company. Everybody knows them. They have this podcast. People are going to want to advertise on it, but there really wasn't the emotional connection with the audience, right? It wasn't it wasn't within a genre that advertisers were really attracted to. So for us, we want to make sure that if we're taking on a relationship that we can sell ads and sometimes the more obscure content can be more difficult to place ads on. So even if it's interesting and there is this niche audience for that content, if it's not something the advertisers are interested in buying, then we're not interested in it. Um, and then I also tend to look for content that isn't too polarizing. Um, that can be good or bad, right? I know like conservative talk shows can produce great results for advertisers. Um, and on the flip side, I'm sure they can too. But for us, we're trying to maintain a level of brand safety. And so that means that we are looking for content where it isn't too politically driven or content that isn't too um, over the top with expletives or just with material where, you know, you, you would be concerned about how the advertiser would be placed. So, yeah. So those are the things we look at. Makes business sense. What about uh, B2C vs B2B on my side? I only do B2B. Yeah. Um, that isn't necessarily a huge consideration for us. Um, there are always advertisers interested in B2B um, and advertisers interested in B2C. So, so we're good with both. What do you have to say on sponsoring someone else via sponsoring your own company? At what point can, do you know if it's better to have a sponsor that would pay me a thousand bucks per episodes via sponsoring my own services? if I get at least one person that's interested in my service per episode and I sell my service for like 1.5K a month. Yeah, I, I think that you bring up such a good point. And when we talk about monetization, obviously I'm in the business of selling advertising. And uh, so that's how we can help monetize a show. So of course, someone like me is gonna be like, hey, sponsorship's way better. I think from a podcaster perspective, there's a lot of different reasons why you might want to have a show. I have my own podcast called, called the Podcast to Advertising Playbook. And on that show, my goal is to interview as many podcast advertisers in this space as possible. Now, I don't have that show so I can create ad revenue. I have that show so that I can create relationships and so that I can create content for the industry that I really believe is gonna help the space. So for me, having a conversation with someone that maybe I couldn't otherwise have if I didn't have a podcast is worth far more than ad dollars. And um, like in your case, it's very possible that monetizing your show through the, you know, the, the channel of selling your own products ultimately is going to be more successful for you. So when you're looking at that monetization piece, advertising is just one element to consider when you're looking at podcasts, there's the product sales, there's marketing, there's Patreon, you know, or um, any sort of listener support that you can gather. So, you know, there's a variety of ways you can make money. And ultimately it's about you sitting down and saying, how can I get to that path best? I also would say that they're not necessarily mutually exclusive, right? So maybe you decide that you're going to have two ad spaces per episode and one of those is going to be to promote your product and service. And one of those is going to be to promote an advertisers. So, and then maybe at the very end of the podcast, you say, Hey, you know, if you want to get extra episodes that no one else has access to subscribe and save, you know, or subscribe and get additional access. So you can also, you know, tap into multiple streams of revenue for your podcast as well. How do you get your new clients generally? 
we do a lot of cold calling. So um, we have a sales team and there of course are agency relationships that we have that are very well established and those agencies are buying a lot of ads within the ad space. But my goal is to try and find companies that aren't advertising in the podcast space yet. So as an industry, last year we surpassed 1 billion in ad sales, which was the first time we had done that in um, 2020. Five, I believe they're projecting we're going to get to four billion. Um, so that kind of gives you an idea of the growth project trajectory. But realistically, most businesses are not considering podcast advertising. And so our job is how do we go out and find either new agency relationships or new brand relationships with companies and say, hey, you should really be tapping into this. There's something really special about the connection between a host and an audience, and you can create great results with a campaign like this. When it comes to your prices, do you take a percentage of the ads you place or do you just charge a flat consulting fee on a monthly basis? We take a percentage. So it's very, I would say, common within the podcast space, either if you're a network or a rep firm to take a percentage of the ad sales. And so that's what we do. Let's call it a 50K budget a month and you take 10% of that? We take 30. Whoa, okay. And 50K, is that like an average ad spend on a monthly basis? You know, it really depends. Um, our minimum ad spend is $5,000, but I mean, we have advertisers that spend, you know, a hundred thousand plus. So it just really depends on the size of the company. It depends on how much they're investing within the ad space um, in podcasting. So some companies really have very large budgets and they want, they want it to be so that it doesn't matter you know, what podcast you listen to, you're going to hear an ad for them, right? So whether that's like online therapy or, or health products that, you know, you're going to, oh, I hear that advertiser again. So maybe I listened to five podcasts this week and on all five, I'm hearing that same ad. So some companies spend a lot because they're really looking to have a heavy reach. Other companies are maybe trying podcast advertising for the first time. Maybe they have a very, you know, targeted audience that they're looking to reach and they'll have a smaller budget. You see a bunch of cool podcasts here on your roster. Um, so they don't pay anything, right? No. Mm -mm. Okay. So what's your, I mean, okay. Yeah. You already mentioned a strategy of they need X amount of views. They need to be in, in uh, Y segment, for example, and not be uh, too uh, provocative, quote unquote. So you have a prox, let's call it uh, 150 podcasts right there. So we have about a hundred. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot of choice for an advertiser. Um, how do you pick them? Because me, I'm a cold email guy. You know, and I was surprised by when, when you said that you would, you were cold calling because you were like, yeah, conservative. And then I heard cold calling and like, oh, that's interesting. I didn't expect that. Um, how do you build your, your lists? You know, do you start um, from listen notes, for example, do you scrape these lists, how, how do you go with that? Well, it's interesting in our business because we really have two different clients. So the podcasters are one set of clients because we have to have the inventory or we don't have anything to sell. Uh, but the advertisers are the clients that give us the money. And so we have to go with them as well. So obviously we have different tactics for each of them. Um, I feel like we've been in a really lucky place in terms of podcast recruitment that we've been in business long enough and we have a good reputation. So we get a lot of incoming leads of podcasters that email us on a regular basis and say, hey, we represent my show. And then it's really like going through that list of, is this going to be a good fit? Are we going to be good partners? Um, and we do outreach and we do recruitment efforts as well, because we're always looking to grow our roster. Um, when it comes to advertisers, obviously we want to make sure we're getting as much low hanging fruit as possible. So who's already advertising in the podcast space? Are we going after those people? Then we're looking at um, our hosts will often send us a list of products that they really like. And so so if we can say, oh, well, this host really loves this, you know, particular food product, or they really love this particular luggage company or clothing company, then we can reach out to that company and say, hey, we've got a host that's really interested in, in promoting your product. 
one thing that I try to talk about a lot is our ad reads are host read endorsement type ads. And so these ads are really influencer marketing. And so making that kind of connection between the host and the product is really important. So our job is really to be a, a strong matchmaker. I agree with that. Do you mean also that they read it live every podcast or they pre-record it? They're all pre-recorded um, and we do um, primarily dynamic ad insertion. So what that means is that the advertiser is buying a certain number of impressions over a specific time period. So it doesn't matter if the listener listens to episode one that was released two years ago, or if they listen to episode 100 that's being released today, they can um, be exposed to the advertiser's message. Hmm. It's a very interesting business. Any tips for me if I want to, because for example, I go on Google podcast, then I can scrape like the, the full podcast episode in there. I can have the guest name. I use that strat mm -hmm. uh, to get more guests to my podcast and uh -huh. say, I saw you there. And I also scrape the sponsors um, on each podcast. So is that the best strategy there is? There's also listen notes, but they cost a fortune. Uh -huh. um, what else would you go in that scraping slash hacker mindset? I mean, in my opinion, if you're doing that, I think that you're ahead of the game. Cause I think most people are not doing that. Um, we subscribe to a service called, um, pod, uh, pod chaser and pod chaser really, it ranks the podcast. It gives us an idea of their audience size. It gives us an idea of like, we know where they're hosting their show. We know, um, kind of some of the demographics of the audience and if they've had advertisers and who the advertisers are, it also shows us who's advertising in the space. Um, so I really like that service. Um, but it, there's a cost that goes along with that. So I would say if you're doing your own scraping, that's probably best. I heard about them. I'm going to check them out again. I want to learn more about the pod broker, which is your new baby. Tell me a bit more about that one. Yeah, sure. So I started the podcast broker about a year ago. And the reason I started that company is because while there are large acquisitions that have happened in the space where, you know, a company maybe like Gimlet or Wondery has been acquired by a company like Amazon, um, the average podcaster doesn't have the opportunity to sell their show because they're not part of some, you know, large network. And so I started the broker to buy and sell entire podcasts. So if someone has a show that's established, it's generating revenue, um, they've got a decent audience base, they can come to us and we will then find a buyer for them who wants to buy the entire show. And um, that has been really an interesting business because it's something that really no one else is doing right now. And having the ability to make the connection is has been really very rewarding, both for the hosts of the show many of whom are contracted to stay on and continue to host the show, um, but also from the buyer because the buyers are looking to often create a nice network of shows. Love the businesses there. Where can people find out more about you, Heather? I am all over LinkedIn. So if you just look for Heather Osgood on LinkedIn, I come up um, and I try to create a lot of content there specifically addressing podcast advertising. Um, and you can also, of course, uh, come to our website at truenativemedia.com or thepodcastbroker.com. Now is Charles Cormier, your host for another founder, wisdompodcast.com. And that was Heather Osgood.